In this second part of lecture three, we're going to continue our study of divergent soft theorems. In particular, I'll derive a master formula that makes it possible to derive the soft theorems for photons and gravitons from one single formula in the 4D spinner helicity formalism, as well as giving us many more interesting results. Why do I want to show you this derivation? Well, one thing is that it illustrates the power of on-shell amplitudes methods when combined with analytic continuation into the complex plane. A more standard way of illustrating this is to derive the recursion formulas, but that can be found so many in so many different lectures already at this point, whereas this is relatively new. Moreover, from this master formula, it also follows that there are some very fundamental results that I'm sure you've heard of, but may never have seen a proof of. And so I want to show you those. Uh, in particular, I'll show you two properties. One is the way to derive the general relativity equivalence principle in the amplitude language. I'll state more precisely what that means in the third part of the lecture when we do this. And using the master formula, we will also be able to demonstrate that higher spin particles, namely particles with spin greater than 2, such massless particles cannot cobble consistently to lower spin particles, meaning spin 2 and lower, in flat space. Finally, one can also derive from this master formula that an interacting gravitino must couple supersymmetrically to a graviton. This last property I'll not show in the recorded lecture, but I can write it out in the lecture notes if you guys are interested. So let's go. We're now going to derive a 4D soft limit master formula. And in this derivation, we'll assume that all particles involved are massless. So we'll be working below the mass scale of any masses. So here is, is the intuition. There are three steps in this derivation that I'll show you. First, let's use our intuition. In what we have seen, even in the first lecture, divergent terms arise from cubic interactions because the propagator ends up going on shell in the soft limit. So when PS goes to zero, the PS in this propagator goes to zero, you end up with K squared, K squared is zero, so clearly there's a divergence from the propagator. This is opposed to diagrams such as this one here with a quartic interaction, where when P in this formula, PS goes to zero, then you just end up having K1 plus K2 squared, and generically that's not going to blow up. So this gives no divergence as PS goes to zero, but this one does give a divergence. And we know from the part one of the lecture that that divergence goes as to k dot ps. That's where it comes from. The other thing we know extremely well in a theory of massless particles is the free particle amplitudes. And that's one of the things we saw in lecture two, that these free particle amplitudes are uniquely fixed by the helicity of the free particles that are involved in that vertex. And that allows one then to give very powerful results. We know that the divergent terms for the soft theorems arise from things with cubic interactions, and those cubic interactions we know up to overall constants. And that, we'll see, is very powerful. Now, the second step of the derivation involves kinematics. And in the third step, we're going to use our knowledge about the free particle vertex. But first, let's study the kinematics of how this works. So in the kinematics, we want to take the momentum, the soft momentum, PS, and we scale it to zero with epsilon going to zero. But the question then is, how do I do this while keeping all momentum on shell and preserve momentum conservation? So in particular, how to preserve momentum conservation at finite values of epsilon while we take epsilon to zero. So that is what step two is about. And so let me argue what this, what this means. So I imagine that I have some n plus one particle amplitude and I take PS in its soft and I should get something that involved an endpoint amplitude. For that endpoint amplitude, 
there are k momenta. And so in the limit where epsilon is strictly zero, I need to have momentum conservation fulfilled by those n momenta. So I have something that looks like this. Equivalently, in spinner-helicity language, this says that k angle k square summed up from k equals 1 to n must be zero, just after contraction with the sigma matrix. So what do I do when epsilon is small but finite? Well, I want to imagine that I deform the momenta. And the momenta are all n plus 1 momenta that I deform. I deform by putting a hat on them. So I devise uh, on-shell momentum P as hat, which is on-shell, so I can write it a null, so I can write it in terms of an angle and a square spinner that I also denote likewise with hats. And for each one of the case, I imagine also that I have a similar continuation or deformation. And it must be such that for these hatted momenta, momentum conservation holds, but it holds for the n plus 1 of them together. So the sum over the k hats plus p hat is 0. That ensures that in the limit, when epsilon goes to 0, where the hatted variables must become the same as the unhatted variables, that I return to endpoint momentum conservation. Now, I want, of course, that I deform my s with an epsilon, and my s hat square, I will not deform at all. Uh, and here, by doing this, I assume, as we discussed in the first part of the lecture, that ps is a particle, that particle s is a particle with positive, or at least non-negative, helicity. If it had had negative helicity, I would have used the square brackets to shift with uh, to scale with the epsilon instead of the angles. But here we assume that it's something that has positive helicity. Now, how do I then deform? So this is how I deform momentum s. How do I deform the other n momenta? Well, I choose to just deform two of them. So I choose a pair i and j among the 1 through n other lines. And those i and j's are the only ones I deform. So that means that k angle hat is equal to k, and k square hat is equal to k square for all k that are not equal to the special pair i and j. But for i and j, I choose to deform this, the squares, but not the angles, in a particular way, so as to ensure that I get the momentum conservation rule that I wanted up here. How do I do that? I do that as follows. And this was first, this particular, well, we'll come back to how this was first done. So there's a shift by epsilon, that is to absorb the epsilon that sits in the S. And then of course, this somehow has to depend on S, but it also depends on J. And so there's a shift that's proportional to a number, which is this number here, that is momentum dependent, times square bracket s, and then similarly for j hat. There's a parallel expression, and it also shifts with some number times square bracket s. So let's, shop, let's check and let's ensure ourselves that this in fact does the trick. So we want, zero to be equal to the sum over the k-shifted momenta, now written in spinner helicity formalism, plus the n plus first momentum that we just called s, 
Those shifted moments, huh? what are they equal to? Well, if I look at the k's first, then all of the k's, including i and j, have an unshifted part, which is just what they used to be. And then there's going to be all the epsilon dependence. So all the epsilon dependence is the following. It's epsilon plus times s angle times s square. That what comes from this part here. So let's color code it. This term gives rise to this part, including the epsilon, of course. And then arising from the yellow parts up here, we get the following. We get angle i times angle bracket j s divided by angle bracket j i times s square minus j angle times i s divided by i j times square s. And I just have room to close that bracket. And these again came from the shifts in the square brackets of i and j that we had right up here. Good. Now let's notice that in all these expressions there's an s square bracket and let's let us know what to do with the other things. Well the first thing we should actually point out is that the sum over the k momenta that is exactly what we assume the k momenta to satisfy to begin with, that this was zero. And so these sum up to zero, the unshifted n momenta satisfy momentum conservation. Then the other part that is left should better sum to zero too in order for this statement to be true. And let's see how this works. So I'm going to pull out from this expression here. And, and actually what I just want is the expression inside the epsilon part. And it writes as follows, there's a square bracket S and then I'm, I'm see two terms are divided by an angle IJ. Here I'm interchanging the order here, that's going to cost me a minus sign. And I will in fact likewise interchange the order of these two brackets here, that's going to cost me a minus sign too. So let's see where we land. Where we land is the following, I have an S angle bracket from here. This gets multiplied by an i j angle bracket to compensate for the fact that I divided out one over all. Then I have plus i angle angle spinner because I got a minus from interchanging the i and j in the denominator of that term. And then this multiplies j s angle bracket. Likewise I have a plus times j angle spinner because I interchange I and S, I will interchange I and S here to get S I. And then that's the whole thing. And now you see something very nice. This is the sum of three terms with a cyclic ordering of the states I, J, S, I, J, S, I, J, S, cyclically. And this is exactly the Skouten identity, and therefore this is zero. And again, the Skouten identity was the identity that said that three two-component spinners must be linearly dependent. And so, indeed, this is what we end up with. Okay, so just to recap, what have we devised? We have devised a way by shifting two lines, i and j, together with our soft lines, s, in such a way that everywhere along the finite limit of, of epsilon going to zero for any finite value of epsilon, momentum conservation holds for the n plus one particle. So we're taking the epsilon going to zero limit along a line where in which momentum conservation holds, which is important because otherwise how can I make sense of my on shell amplitude along that such an epsilon going to zero limit. We're not quite done yet with our kinematics because now look at the following. Now, with the shifted momenta, if I have a diagram with a cubic interaction and my soft line attached to it and some line k here, the internal momentum that sits here is pks, 
And now, of course, I have to look at the shifted momenta. So this is PK hat plus PS hat. Now I would like to understand what this propagator is, because I know the divergences are supposed to arise from this propagator. So let me compute this denominator of this propagator. So that's P hat squared of, with K and S shifted. And we know how to write this in the spinner helicity language in terms of a product of an angle bracket and a square bracket. Now, none of the angles of the K shift and the angle with S only shifts with epsilon. So this is going to give me epsilon times KS. And either the square bracket of K doesn't shift if it's not I or J, or it will shift, but it will shift by an amount which is proportional to S square bracket. So that vanishes when I dot in a K square spinner with it. And so this ends up being just KS. And therefore this is epsilon times the momentum squared of PKS unshifted. So of course, this will go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. But the problem here is that then epsilon going to zero, if I think of this in the complex plane, epsilon being zero is going to be the location of all the poles, no matter what K is. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because one thing I do know about amplitudes is that on their individual factorization pole, the amplitude on these simple poles, the absolute amplitude factorize into an unshelf free particle amplitude and an n-particle amplitude. But in this situation here, this is not what I have. I have that all the poles are hit at the same time as I said epsilon to zero. So imagine if you did this in a type of Park Taylor formula, then all your poles are going to hit by the same. You're not guaranteed to just have a simple pole. So at epsilon equal to zero, not a simple pole, but what we do know are the residues of tree amplitudes at symbol poles. So what we ideally would like to do is to have a way of shifting the individual poles for each different value of k away from epsilon equal to zero by just at least a little bit. So if I could shift away so that pks for, let's say this is p1s, sits here, that's where that square vanishes, p2s sits somewhere s, P, p3s sits somewhere else, then I'll be able to evaluate the residues of each of one of those little poles and then therefore pick up and use my knowledge of the free particle vertex. So for this reason, we're going to introduce a new variable. Uh, we introduce a new variable, z. And z, you should think of as some complex number, basically, like epsilon. And I will simply tell you how we set this up. So we define now our soft line s angle bracket to be epsilon s minus z times some new arbitrary spinner x. So a two component commuting spinner, angle spinner, which is just uh, arbitrary. I'm not saying anything about what it is, except that I really don't want it to be S because then I'm not doing something. So I deform my S soft line a little bit away, but in such a way that Z should always be less than epsilon, such that when I take epsilon to zero, Z also goes to zero so that I still have something that is like a soft limit. Okay. But I need to preserve momentum conservation. By the way, S hat remains uh, unshifted for the square bracket. Okay, so I need to also in include momentum conservation. And just as before, I will do this by only deforming my two lines, I and J. 
and I leave the angle spinners alone, just like I did before. And then in addition to the epsilon deformation I did before of the square spinners, I also include a Z deformation. Let me show you how. First, I'll write what I did before. And then in addition to this, I will compensate the shift in the S hat angle bracket by Z by a similar shift here in these square brackets. And you'll see by the similarity of the way I shift these that I will not even have to do the calculation again to ensure myself that momentum conservation will hold again for the n plus 1 variables for finite epsilon and finite c. And the reason is that the new z contributions again vanish by the scouting identity. So you can see just as before, the shifts are by the square spinner in the S momentum. And now the role of S that was associated with S here is now played in the new shift by X. And that is exactly how by the scouting identity these ends up satisfying N plus one particle momentum conservation. And it's okay by scouting, just like we showed before. Now what we have here amounts to the shift or the deformation of the momentum variables that we're going to be using. Let me try, let me then assure you that what this C deformation does is actually move the poles for each of the cube, for each of the cubic vertices in the amplitude, I'm going to move those away from the origin of epsilon. Let's see how this works. So now we have that P K S squared hat, namely the internal momentum in such a diagram here. Just as before, it's of course equal to K hat S hat angles angle bracket times K hat s hat square bracket. Just as before, I can immediately remove the hat on the s square spinner because that didn't shift at all. That also means since even i and j, the only ones who get shifted among all the k particles, are shifted by something that amounts both in the c shift and in the epsilon shift by something that shifts with a square spinner s dotted into S, this vanishes, so we can remove the hat also on the K. Now we know how S shifts, and it shifts both with epsilon and with the Z dependence. And so let us write out exactly what this gives. By the way, I can of course also remove the hat on the K, because none of the angle Ks would shift. So what are we ending up with? We're ending up that this depends only on the shift that we found in S hat, and that amounts to epsilon times k s minus z times k x. And this then multiplies square spinner at k dotted in with square spinner s. I can rewrite this, and now you see this is different from before because it involves the z dependence, as epsilon minus epsilon k times angle k s square k s and this of course is p k s squared and here i've defined epsilon k to be what i get by simply um, taking outside the expression here angle k s angle bracket k s so this epsilon k is z times k x divided by k s and so that now becomes exactly location of these different poles, so that now what I have in the complex plane and this is the complex epsilon plane, I'll have that not all the that the poles are not all located 
in the same spot at epsilon equal to zero, but rather they move out to say epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, epsilon k, etc. And that then allows me to compute all the residues because I can go to each one of the poles separately by just involving a small z that is different from epsilon. So we're in a limit where c is less than epsilon, which we assume to be small. And I can then look at a small region around the origin that encaptures all the different poles and calculate the residues off of each of these ones when I really want the residue of the entire thing. Okay, so again, the idea now is that on each pole, epsilon equal to epsilon k, the residue is the product of a three particle amplitude times some n particle leftover amplitude. And that is what we'll then exploit in step number three. Okay, so let's take a look in particular at the epsilon k pole and think about having a tiny little contour around that that picks up the residue at this pole. This will correspond to, and this is the only thing it can possibly or correspond to in the diagram, a cubic interaction with, with s and k going in. They of course had it, and I have pks right there. And then this connects to whatever the rest of the amplitude is, which is something that I can call a n hat. Because, of course, these lines are also shifted in some fashion. Now, this k that sits here could be 1, 2, up to n. And that includes, of course, the lines i and j that also sit among those. Now, what do I get? When I look at my n plus 1 particle amplitude, with lines 1 through n, as well as s. Now, in terms of the shifted momentum, the shifted momentum p hat k and p s hat, it depends on z and epsilon, and I'll write that dependence explicitly. The contribution from this particular diagram, or this particular simple pole to this amplitude, will be captured by the residue at this pole. And so we know what that is. It's a three particle amplitude that depends on s hat and k hat and minus the momentum pks hat, as well as, well as whatever is left over. And I'll denote this by k to show that this is the amplitude that I get with the k external line here. This may depend on z as well. And of course, I'm imagining that I'm moving epsilon, I'm in the epsilon plane, and I'm moving epsilon to be close to epsilon k. So therefore, I only write a c-dependence in the residue. And then, of course, this is divided by the piece that gives the pole. Again, here, p, k, s squared is going to be zero. That is equivalent to saying that epsilon is equal to epsilon k. So that is the contribution you have for each possible line k that line s can attach to. And so when I look at the entire amplitude and I expand in small epsilon, then what I get is that the entire n plus 1 amplitude in the shifted momenta will be equal to a sum over all the poles epsilon k, which means that I'm summing over k equals 1, 2, up to n, of exactly the type of residue that I wrote up here. Right there. This is the only place that an epsilon pole or any kind of divergent term in epsilon can possibly come from. And so everything else that would possibly be in the amplitude that is not of this form must be of order epsilon to the zero. Very good.
Now, what do we then know about each of these pieces? Let's start here with the denominator. The denominator, we need to evaluate the residue, so we should write it in a form that we know, and we already calculated what that form is. Indeed, we did that up here, that p hat squared is equal to something that involves the simple pole at epsilon equal to epsilon k times the unshifted momentum. So let's write that out. This is epsilon minus epsilon k times pks unshifted squared. I can write it out explicitly by using what we calculated epsilon k to be. And I can pull out the epsilon because I want to collect divergent terms in epsilon. And so this becomes pks squared times epsilon times 1 minus z over epsilon times kx angle bracket divided by ks angle bracket. Okay, so now I know what sits in that denominator. And recall, again, I'm after things that are divergent in epsilon. That's why I pulled out this epsilon uh, as uh, that is useful to track as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so now we have to figure out how to get more out of this formula. And the key here now is that we want to, we, we can exploit what we know about free particle amplitudes. So for free particle amplitudes, the little group scaling fixed it. And let me write what the result here now is in the language uh, that we have been using with the shifted variables. We have s hat, k hat, and minus p k s hat. We know that this is some coupling that a priori we don't know anything about. It could be zero or non-zero, times square bracket of all the possibilities with some weights. So let's write those out. And then I'll write the weight here as x1. I'll have k, p hat, x2. Don't worry that I don't use the same ordering as I did in lecture 2. I'll, I'll have kept track of, every, track of everything. And keeping properly track of everything, I know that x1 is hs plus hk, the two labels that appear in the square bracket, minus the one that does not, which I'll just call p. x2 is hk plus hp minus hs, and x3 is hp plus hs minus hk. Moreover, I know something about the dimension of the coupling. The dimension of the coupling gk, for whatever it is, is 1 minus the sum of all the x's, which is the same as minus the sum of all the helicities. So it's 1 minus hs minus hk minus hp. That's the mass dimension of the coupling. So now we know exactly what this is. Well, except that we should find out exactly what p hat square bracket is that enters here. How do we calculate that? Well, one can show, and I'll spare you the details of it, but it's not hard, and you can ask me in the discussion section if you like. You, one can show that p hat ks is equal to k minus z xs divided by ks times square spinner s. And given that it depends just on these two square spinners, and the way it appears in this formula here have dotted in a k or an s square spinner, it's actually rather easy to see the following. Namely, that the square bracket s k hat is simply the same as s k. The square spinner p hat with s hat, where I can remove the hat on s if I want, is nothing but k s, because when it dotted in with s, the k, the, the contribution from the z dependent part goes away. And finally, the most interesting part is that k with p hat square bracket is minus z angle xs divided by angle ks times k s squares bracket. <laughs>
In fact, this means that all these three square brackets of shifted variables are proportional to the same square bracket that appears up to a sign. And then there is some angle bracket dependence as well as a C. Now, one can take these shifted square spinners, plug them in to the free particle amplitude that sits up here, where we have now resolved the question of what these things are. And then we know what the denominator is here, and there's going to be some endpoint amplitude. And we can explicitly write this out, put it back in, into the formula here, and then explicitly calculate what this whole thing there is. And doing so, we basically arrive at the master formula that I wanted to show you in this lecture. So the master formula is then the following. It is a n plus 1 hat as a function of c and epsilon equal to sum over k equals 1 plus n. There's an implicit sum over internal states here that could run if there's more than one allowed. That is uh, implicit here, but you could write it out explicitly if you wanted to. There's the square bracket ks or sk that showed up in lots of places, and that is to the power, once you collect all the terms, to the 2 hs minus a number a, and that number a is equal, and it's just simply a definition, to the mass dimension of the coupling plus 2 times hs. That, by the way, always ends up being an integer. Because the mass dimension of the coupling cannot be anything but an integer, and 2 times the spin of the soft particle will also be an integer. All right, then there's an angle bracket xs. It comes from up here to the power of 1 minus this a. And this then all multiplies a hat from line k n z. This gets divided by epsilon. This epsilon came from this way of writing the denominator with p hat squared. It multiplies the z to the a minus 1. That came from this C right there. Then there's an angle bracket SK to the 2 minus A that came from here. And then finally, there's the rest of that propagator piece, which is Z, 1 minus Z over epsilon times XK angle bracket divided by SK angle bracket. And anything else that might arise in the amplitude will be of order 1 or higher in the limit where epsilon goes to 0. And so these terms that I write in this sum here are exactly the terms that will capture the divergence in the infrared as epsilon goes to 0. Now, when you look at this formula, it's very puzzling. It depends on some things that it's you would not, might not have thought it should depend on. It depends on this arbitrary complex number z that we put in to move the poles around. And it depends on this arbitrary spinner angle x that we put in in order to achieve momentum conservation with the z-shift. This looks peculiar, and in fact it is. And you might not think that that z-dependence should show up in any physical result. And if you think so, you're exactly correct. And that means you should go to the third part of this lecture and see how we use this master formula to derive exciting and interesting results about quantum field theories, as well as the soft theorems.